and I come from Warsaw. I lived in Warsaw and I was born there. I come from a family, I had three brothers, and I was the only girl. My parents were lived in Warsaw all their life. They had four children, and uh, I guess by the time we really realized what's going to happen, it was too late. We couldn't leave. So we were caught like millions of others. Were you afraid? I was very afraid. I remember I was very afraid. What did you think about? The unknown frightened me. I remember that uh, I was just petrified. Um, and uh, this is what happened in Warsaw. They didn't, you know, the, 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 the Germans um, came in, the whole Poland fell except for Warsaw. In Warsaw they decided to take a stand. So at night they shelled the heavy artillery and then in the daytime they uh, had the bombs flying all over. It was just, poor. Warsaw was very, very destroyed. But somehow we managed, you know, we were hiding in the basement and uh, a lot of people got killed. And it, I think they, they fought over Warsaw like three weeks. Uh, not quite, maybe maybe three weeks. And they bombed the border and they, um, there was no electricity, there was no gas. And then the Germans came in. After the initial, uh, uh, you know, attack, then we didn't have any water. So we drank the water from the, from the Visla, I don't know, there was the river. We took the water out and they were throwing in dead bodies and horses. And there was a typhus epidemic. And I remember my father got very sick and my brother. They were very, very ill. They had a typhus. Uh, and we, it, the conditions were terrible. But slowly, you know, uh, the Germans really, uh, people don't realize, they really did use uh, psychological uh, catchphrases to... to um, so we didn't realize what, what, what was going on or what's going to happen. But in the beginning, they organized the ghetto, and they pushed all the people from the small little towns. They pushed us in and about, I don't know how many square blocks, and they built uh, walls around the Warsaw ghetto. You watched them build the walls? Oh, I watched them build the walls, and we watched, um, and we watched um, you know, and we didn't have no choice. At that time, it was already, really too late. But my two brothers, my two older brothers, you know, they were very young and they were very impetuous and they, um, and they just wouldn't, they couldn't cope with the Germans. Like, you know, when you walked on the sidewalks and a German walked by, you had to walk down. You couldn't walk on the same side and they, they attacked you without provocation. And they were, uh, they just said, I'm not going to take this. I, I'm not going to let anybody spit on me and abuse me. And I don't, I'm sure you know, as other people have told you, that Poland divided in two. Uh, the Russian took half of Poland and uh, the Germany took half. So my brothers decided that they're going to go over on the Russian side and they left. My Why two. did they did make that decision? They made the decision because they felt that they wouldn't be able to, they wouldn't do what they, they, they didn't want to be humiliated. They couldn't, they couldn't stand it. They were very young people and you know, people when they were rebellious and I said, I'm not going to, uh, I'm going to spit back or I'm going to hit him back. I'm not going to take this. So we had a family conference and my parents decided that maybe it would be better if my two older brothers leave. When the Germans started to attack uh, Russia, a lot of people went back to Russia, went deep into Russia, and they didn't. Uh, I don't know why they didn't. So they stayed. Uh, maybe they wanted to come back and reunite with the family or whatever. And then the Russians, the Germans took over and they, they had to dig their own graves and they got killed. And maybe they wanted to come back and be close to you. But yes, I have the feeling that they did. And um, I wish they wouldn't. I wish they would have gone back, uh, because a lot of people did survive in Russia. What was happening to you? To me, I was a very, very mature, very sheltered little girl. And when the war, war broke out, I grew up overnight just really did. My parents were not even 40 years old, my mother and my father. They were young people and um, my father went out one day to the drugstore to get some medicine and never came back. He never came back? Uh, they, you know, the Germans went out, they, they were always trucks around and they picked up people and there was a blockade, he called it like a blockade. So he went out to the drugstore and he never came back. He went out in the ghetto? In the ghetto. 
was quiet, you know, when, there was a, when we knew that the Germans are coming, we didn't go out on the streets, but nothing was happening. And the drugstore was like from here to the end of the building. Did anybody see him? <clears throat> well, he never came back, so we assumed that, you know, there was a lot of people. They were catching people like a dog catcher. You know, when a dog catcher goes out and catches dogs, anybody they saw on the street, they picked up. So my father was picked up. But you don't know? You didn't? Oh, we know. We know he was no, picked but, up. Uh, did, you, did anyone witness it? So, yeah, the people told us that. He, we just, he went out and he never came back. And then my mother and my younger brother was left with myself. And um, my mother was very dependent on my father. She really was, and she, she went to pieces when they took him away. She really, she didn't care. She really didn't care if she lived or no. So I really had to watch over her because um, she kind of like resigned. You know, there was a curfew, and you couldn't go out. And she, she didn't care. She, she, she just, she really wanted to die. But um, somehow I, say I was able to, you know, to watch over her. And then we needed papers, working papers. I remember I went over to a German and I said to him, I'll give you a diamond ring. Give me papers for my, fa for my mother. A girl of 15, who would dare do that? I did. And he did give me the papers. And he did buy a little time for, for them, you know. Without papers, you just didn't have a chance. Wherever I went, I saw people laying on the streets, dying. Like you see the kids in Cambodia now. You see, that's, uh, when I look at those pictures, I get such a pain. Wherever you saw, you saw just uh, agony and pain. Uh, some of the Polish, there was the AK, the Polish um, uh, resistance too to the Germans. They were trying to uh, bring in some ammunition. You had to pay it in gold. So people got together and we got gold, whatever we got, and we paid. But it was nothing, very little, very little came in. Some of them were honest, some of them were not honest. You had to pay in advance and they said to him, look, we're going to deliver you 20 rifles or 20 revolvers. And you gave him the gold and some of them came in and some of them didn't. It was just that we were at their mercy. And with the food, the same thing. You said they smuggled it in through the sewers. Yeah. Were these sewers large enough for people well, to... Well, it wasn't that large enough, but you know, you managed. You were able to bring some stuff in. Some people were hiding themselves in the sewers too, because later on, when the Germans uh, really set up, uh, this is 1943, I was taking, uh, I was living in the ghetto till 1943, May, nine, May, May 10th, you know, when the, the Jewish Warsaw Uprising was, I was taking out almost one of the last people from the Warsaw Ghetto. Were you fighting with arms? Uh, we were fighting, you know, what we did in the Warsaw Ghetto, which is, uh, you know, a lot of people don't know and they feel that we weren't really very passive. But if you want to look at history, and I'm sure you know enough, that countries like France or Belgium or Holland, they went, in a few days, the Germans came and took over. The Warsaw Ghetto was holding up for four weeks. Even Poland didn't hold out for four weeks. We were holding out for four weeks. The Germans were really afraid to come into the Warsaw Ghetto. What we did is we, when they, they, they came in with tanks, and they decided to liquidate the Warsaw Ghetto. And this was in 1943, Passover. And we all were prepared, a few people left up. At that time was maybe, I would say, you know, uh, in, in Poland we had three million Jews living. And in, in Warsaw, I would say maybe a million or maybe more. I'm not, you know, my memory is not that, that great, but I would say more than a million Jews lived in Warsaw. And uh, by that time, were maybe 20,000 people left. When I'm talking in 1943, maybe 30. And the Germans decided to liquidate the Warsaw Ghetto. And when they came into the Warsaw Ghetto, uh, we didn't have much ammunition, so we threw uh, the Molotov, Molotov cocktails on the tanks. And a lot of Germans got killed. So what we did, we took away their ammunition. I was part of it somewhat, not that involved with it. I, I, I had all my energies to, to, to just keep my mother and my brother together, but I lived in the same house, so there was a lot going on, and we also had ammunition. What did you see in your house? It was Mila 18, I understand. You see, Mila 18, what happened is, in 1939, when they bombed Warsaw, 
This building was bumped, hollowed out in the middle. The bomb hit it in the middle. So the bunker was on the bottom, and we were hiding up on the third floor, on the fourth floor. It was big, you know, Vosa was a big city with big uh, apartments. So what we did is we had to go up with a rope to pull ourselves up to hide there, but you couldn't get up there. It was completely... You know what, you know, you 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 understand what I'm saying. Yes. The middle, middle building was all around the middle. There were no stairs. There was no stairs. So we had to, and the bunker, the resistance bunker was on Mila 18, and they were on the bottom. So we were very involved with it. They were all young people. You know, Mordechai Anilevich and the other bunch of people, they were all living there. Where was your mother now? Uh, this is another one which is very hard. You see, my mother was with me and my brother. One day, when the Germans came in, this was at the very end of the Warsaw Ghetto. I want you to know my mother wasn't even 40 years old. Neither was my father. But my mother was, um, the Germans were coming, and we had to pull ourselves up on that rope, I told you, in the building. And uh, she couldn't make it, so she went into the bunker below with the mm -hmm. resistance. Uh, it wasn't exactly, there were several bunkers. We didn't make big bunkers because we didn't want it. If the Germans will come in, we should have, not all the people should be caught. So we, we had like five different bunkers downstairs. And we were hiding upstairs, maybe 50, 60 people upstairs. My mother couldn't make the rope because the Germans were coming very rapidly. And uh, she was hiding downstairs. And uh, after they left, the Germans, I went to look for her and she was gone. They came, you know, we were upstairs, I told you. They came with a fire truck and with a ladder. They took us all down, so it was my brother, myself. At that time I was married, my husband and um, his sisters. We were all hiding there. Maybe 50 people, 40 people, 50 people. This is all that was left? Uh, and the bunker downstairs. Mordechai Anilevich, I guess a couple days later, he wrapped himself around in a Jewish flag and he was burned right on the ghetto. It was burning, everything was burning. You couldn't stay there, they, they smoked us out. People had to get out from the houses, we couldn't hide. And then, not only on top of this, after the houses were burning, they came in and they demolished them, so even if you were hiding, the people got suffocated underneath. You said you were married. I what? Was married. I, I got married in the ghetto. Why? My father, before he was taken away, uh, he felt like I was very young, he wanted to protect me. You know, a lot of people got married in the ghetto. Amazingly, uh, everybody got married because he felt, well, you're going to die anyway, might as well. You wanted to attach yourself to someone. You wanted to be, have some connections with somebody else. My father was afraid if something is going to happen to him, I should have someone to help me, to take care of me. So I married. I was 16 years old when I was married. Did your father pick out the young man? Uh, you know, he was interested. He came in to, my father had a grocery store. My husband had a bakery. So he came in and he knew me. And I would have never married under ordinary circumstances. I don't think it would ever happen. But uh, my father felt, look, he was 10 years older than I am and he will take care of me. And, and we had it better because he was in the, he, he, his father was in the baker business. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people used to bring down a mink colt, diamond for a loaf of bread. So he had food. And my father felt that I'm going to be well taken care of if I marry him. So I was married in the ghetto. Sounds strange, but a lot of people marry in the ghetto. You'd be surprised, really. Uh, so I was with his family and my brother, we were together. My mother was taken a few days before. And then they took us all to Majdanek. Your husband too? My husband too. Myself. So, but when we went to Majdanek, this was just the most terrible. As much as I experienced bad things after, but this was, they put us in cattle cars. And they pushed in, I don't know how many people, but they really wanted us to die. And uh, we were in this, those wagons. Um, uh, I don't know how many people were there. 
But my brother died in my arms. My younger brother who was My husband's two sisters. There was not enough oxygen for all those people, and they kept us in those wagons for days. They wanted us to die in the wagons. You know, the kettle cars with very little windows. How old was your brother? Maybe 13. He wasn't even by my spirit. So, you know, when my brother died in my arms, I said to myself, I'm going to live. I must be the only one survivor for my family. I'm going to live. I made up my mind that I'm going to defy Hitler. I'm not going to give in because he wants me to die. I'm going to live. I'm going to just be very, very strong. And I went to Majdanek. And this is the interesting story because when I came to Majdanek, and I went to, they put me in a block with 500 other women. Somebody told me my mother's there. My mother was taken a few days before, as I told you. So I went to see her, and you know, my mother was there. So it's like I lost her twice, really. But she was very, very lost. She was lost. She was very passive, she was very lost. And you know, they gave you uh, one portion of bread and one portion of, of soup for the day. And I, my mother became very skinny and she was very thin and she was uh, very, you know, lost. So I used to bring her my soup to her and, my, and I just cut off a little piece of bread and I said to her, you know, somebody gave it to me, eat it. And I used to give it to her and run out because if she would say to me, eat a little bit, I would eat. I was very hungry, but I felt that she needs it more than, you know, I was younger. She needs it more than myself. So I used to give her the soup and run out because I didn't want to be tempted that I should eat with her. And she was in the ghetto for, she was in the camp with me for about maybe six weeks, two months. Every few weeks, they used to we select, you know, have selections. And uh, one day, um, just before they took me to Auschwitz, I walked down with her, and she went one way, and I went the other way. And I, I, I had a friend, which we, we were hiding out in the ghetto together. We were ch childhood friends for many, many years. Uh, she didn't let me. She pulled me back. I said, how can I let her go? And she said, Helen, you're not going to help her. You know where she's going. And I, 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 I stayed. And then we, I went to Auschwitz. They sent us to Auschwitz. And I, wasn't, I was the only one left from the whole family. My husband was separated from the beginning. The men were different. And uh, in my Danik, one of my husband's sister was with me. And she was such a strong girl, a beautiful young woman, maybe 25, 26. And we slept on the same bunk, and she d developed diarrhea. And she was very, very cold. And she only wanted me to lay next to her to warm her body, but she, she just didn't feel anything. She was, she had very like, I don't know what you call it, dysentery or something. It was just awful. I had to lay next to her because she was dying. And she said, Helen, please stay next to me, you know, warm me. And, I, and she was the last one. She went too. She died in the bed? She lied by my arms, just like my brother did. It wasn't a bed, it was a bunk for five people. Did it have a mattress? A straw. a straw. And she was laying there and she was, the smell was so awful. I was dying, but she was so scared. She was old, that's all. She was crying. I should stay with her. So I did. I stayed till, till she became cold and stiff in my arms. I remember when I was in Auschwitz, and at the block where I was, there was a girl who had a baby. Would you believe it if I tell you this? She had a baby. We were able to hide this baby for months. 
We delivered the baby ourselves. I, I don't know. I, tell us about this. I, 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 you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I really it? cannot. It's very hard. It's very hard to explain it to you. It's very hard to explain. Uh, we just did it. What we had to do, we did. Our aim was to defy Hitler, to do everything we can to live, because when you lived, this he wants us to die, and we didn't want to. We didn't. We didn't want to oblige him. This was our way of fighting back. In Auschwitz, the day started four o'clock in the morning. Four o'clock in the morning, you had to go outside, stay five in a row. The block was five hundred people in one block. And the Germans had a compulsion, and that's why they have such fantastic records. Had to be counted every single prisoner, had to be counted every single day. By name or by number? By number. Every block had so many people, they had to come and count you. And we used to stay for hours. This is the way they wore us down. They wanted to wear us down. And we used to huddle our bodies together because, you know, the bodies gave out some warmth. For hours we used to stay on those appels, and then after this, the orchestra started to play, and we went to work. What do you mean the orchestra started? Oh, we to had play? a we had an orchestra coming, and our orchestra coming or going to work, and our orchestra when we were left. You never heard of that? What kind of music did they play? German marches. We should march. Do you remember them? No, I don't remember them, but I know they. We had an orchestra leaving to work, and we had an orchestra coming home. Who were? Who were the prisoners? People? Some of whatever who ever played an instrument had to, you know, uh, they had an, uh, I would say about 10, 12 people in the orchestra leaving in the morning. And if, coming. You, if you heard any of these marches now. Oh, please. Uh, you know, I would certainly recognize it. I'm not a muse uh, musical lover, but uh, I do things you don't forget. Sometimes we snuck in a little bit of a Jewish melody too. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of the players, but um, I think a lot of them may, maybe were Jewish women. Of, who you, played. They were Jewish melodies? Some of them, they, you yeah. know, they, 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 they sometimes snuck in. I remember we used to march. I remember one time we marched with the Germans, and when we marched, they, they were Germans with dogs, with a big... So if somebody runs away, uh, the dogs was, was just terrible. Anyway, uh, we used to sing, I remember, what did we used to sing? Um, the Germans didn't know it's a Jewish song. But it had, they wanted only melodies which, like, uh, you know, add itself to a rhythm of walking. So in, in we, Jewish, a Hebrew song. A Hebrew song. Um, I don't remember right now, but I remember we used to sing that song a lot when we were marching. Uh, or some other songs. You know, they didn't know it was Jewish. Can you sing them? No, oh, no, I, 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 I'm not good with singing, but this was one of the word songs. Zugnishtoy the guys in the letzten Weg. Do you understand what it means? No. Don't tell no one that you, this is your last, last march. This is the partisan song. There were like five or six girls who were working the pool room, where they put actually the ammunition, you know, the, the, the what do you call the powder, into the grenade. So they were every day searched from head to toe naked. And um, when they were going into work and when they left work, but they were able to smuggle out some of the pulver. How? In the vagina, in the mouth, we were able to smuggle out some of the powder. The powder was in something? In a capsule, yeah. very small capsule, which were put, inserted into the grenade. So they, they, and then we gave it to the men and we blew up one crematorium in Auschwitz. So I want you to know that they was in the camp, in the concentration camp, with Germans surrounded, with Really, the impossible. We did blow up. We did blow up one crematorium. When the Germans were looking to the ruins of the crematorium, they were able to find the shells, and they saw it was from our factory. And this was in 1944, at the very end of the war. Was you see, I was liberated in Auschwitz. I was liberated in 1945, in January 1945, by the Russians. So this was already, the war was going very bad for the Germans. 
and they took the five girls or the six girls who were working in this ammunition factory and they hung them. As were well, all 18, 19, 20 years girls. One of them was, I told you, I slept with her on the same bunk. One sister was not working there, but the other one was. This was written up once in the Hadassah magazine. I had this article because I, I was carrying the story. It was so heavy with me, I just, I just never got it out of my mind. It was so painful. And the whole camp had to watch. And they were hanging there for three days. You know, when I talk about it, I just have such pain. You know, sometimes at night, I lay and I can't believe what my eyes have seen. I really cannot believe it. You know, I was in, in Auschwitz. <coughs> Whenever I got up in the morning, the lines were unbelievable. The kids used to come in, stay in line, <coughs> waiting to be burned. Whenever I used to get up in the morning, I said, my God, how can God allow this? The kids were standing in line. They didn't know. You see, they, what they did, they showed, when you went into the crematorium, you saw our camp. So they saw that people are working and they were, you know, like a camp going on. So when the people got off the, bo the train, what they saw, they saw our camp. The crematoriums were a little bit, you know, like around the corner. There were lines. Every day there were lines of people and of kids. They bought a transport from Hungary once. Such little kids, they were waiting there. I just wanted God should strike me dead. I couldn't bail. I have nightmares about those lines. After I was liberated, uh, I was two years in a sanatorium. For two years after the war, can you imagine? So it's like it was f five years out of my life. I was never young. There were some doctors, Russian doctors and Czechoslovakian doctors came in with the first, you know, with the first front. And when I was examined, he said to me, under normal circumstances, I don't know, how, it's impossible. It's just a, a medical miracle that you survived. But I told you, I, I really wanted to live. I said to myself, I want to live one day and be free. And one day after the war finished, then I don't care because I really didn't care if I lived or died because I knew that for my whole family, this. Nobody going to be there. Did you find your husband again? Would you believe it that my husband survived? So I put in a, the Red Cross. I put in in the paper my name, and I was looking for family, and he was looking for for his brother. And somebody read it, and he wrote to his brother, and also he thought I'm his sister. And he got us together, and then Joe came. They didn't let him into France, and I was in the hospital. I told you, and I said, I told you. So he came to see me from Czechoslovakia, smuggled in to the, to the border. They didn't, you know, we were staten laws. We didn't have any passport. We were no, we didn't have any state. We didn't belong to anyone. Nobody wanted us. America didn't want us. Nobody, except for Israel, maybe. And also to Israel, you had to smuggle. You had to go on boats. And I wasn't in condition to do that. What did you say when you first saw your husband again? What did you say oh, to each other? I don't know. It's, um, you know, the man I married and the man he was after the war wasn't the same person. And I'm sure I was not the same person either when I was at 16. And later on, uh, but somehow we had a need for each other because he knew who I was. He was the only person who, who knew. You know, you feel like you come from nothing. You are nothing. Nobody knows you. It's, it's, it's a very strange feeling. You need some co contact, some connection. And he was my connection. He was. He knew who I was, and I knew who he was. And we stuck it out. We met. I don't know how many years. I don't know. We're going to be maybe thirty-five or whatever. We we had two children. And he's very different. He he copes differently than I do. And we here, we here to tell you the story, which is hmm. I don't know. I don't know if it was worth it. I don't know if it was worth it because to, you know, 
when I was in concentration camp and even after I said to myself, you know, after the war people will learn, they will know, they will they will see, you know, we will learn. But did we really learn anything? I don't know.